Cool. Um, thanks. All right, everyone has paper. Hopefully you have access to some writing utensil. If you don't, um, I don't know if there's any more paper. There is some paper. Uh, if you need some, um, attack Jesse. Or just raise your hand and I'll come to you. That too. Um, so, hopefully you have access to a writing utensil somehow. All right, problem number one. A train is... No, I'm not. <laughs> Um, so, uh, thank you to actually, thanks to Carl for uh, setting this up. I do teach math. I teach math at a high school in Chicago, a little bit west of Chicago in the suburbs. It's a huge school, like 4,000 kids. Um, and I just, I just finished, I'm about to finish my fifth year there. So I kind of want to teach you um, some of the things I've learned over the course of those years. Uh, some of the things that I've had to deal with with my students, because obviously I'm getting a lot of kids who hate math, because for some reason people don't like the subject, who knew? Uh, so part of my job is getting them to not hate math. And so that's one of the things I want to talk about. Because um, it turns out, I, I, all the pictures I'm going to show you, by the way, these are all real things my students have turned into me. <laughs> Turns out they don't like to do stuff. Um, but I actually did get a really nice email from a student because um, the school year ended, so he sent me this. <laughs> you see how he butters me up and then asks me for the code to the website so we can download torrents. Because really that's what our class is about. <laughs> um, okay, so here's one of the issues, and by the way, I, I've taught a lot of different classes at the school, but this year I taught like regular geometry, um, I've taught honors algebra 2 with trigonometry, I've taught uh, advanced statistics, so a little bit of a variety of range there. Um, but this is one of the problems we seem to come across a lot, and this is what I encounter all the time. Kids don't know how to think mathematically. If you ask people why they hate math, they hate math because to them it's a lot of just memorizing formulas, plug and chug, it's not relevant to anything, and they don't know how to think mathematically. I think if they knew how to think mathematically, they would see like the beauty in math, because it really is cool. It's kind of the same issue with science. Like if you really understand how science works and how people discover things, it's really amazing how far we've come. Um, but if you just see it as like, oh, there's a periodic table with stuff in it, yeah, you're not gonna like it. Um, and let me give you a couple examples of what I mean by talking, uh, thinking mathematically. Um, in my book, we talk about volume of different shapes for geometry, and they sometimes give you the volume of a cone. And there's a formula for the volume of a cone, and you can plug stuff in. But this is a shape they're not used to seeing. It's like a cone with that little part cut off. Um, and in the book, they'll tell you, it's called a frustum, but they have a radius at the top for that circle, and a radius at the bottom for that circle, and there's a height. And then in the book, they actually give you this formula for, the, for how to calculate the volume. Kid looks at this, kid's like, screw that, not doing that. Like, I'll just get that one wrong on the test and hope everything else will be okay. Um, but here's the thing. The rest, the volume of like the cone, that wasn't a big deal for a lot of them. If they're thinking mathematically, hopefully they're not sitting there thinking, oh crap, I have to memorize that. Hopefully they're thinking, oh, that's just a big cone with a little cone chopped off. And if I can think of it that way, it's not that hard of a problem. I just got to do subtraction, really. Um, or how about this one? And maybe you remember this from geometry. Like, calculate the distance between those two points. And this is, this is the formula that we have in our book. It's this. And the kids never remember which letters to put or which signs to use, like where's the plus, where's the minus, and they just they screw it up all the time. So I stopped teaching it like that because it doesn't work. Um, and here's the way to think about it mathematically. The one thing everyone remembers from geometry, the one formula anyone remembers, anyone want to take a guess? <laughs> That's the only thing people remember, right? Yeah, a squared plus b squared equals c squared in a right triangle, Pythagorean theorem. So that's what we do now. Find the distance from, remember that? Find that distance from the x value there in a to the x value of b. What's the difference between three and six? Three. And the y values between two and nine? Seven. Hey, look, you got a right triangle. Go do Pythagorean theorem. Forget distance formula. Like, it's a lot easier to do it that way. 
That's what I mean by mathematical thinking. It's taking all the stuff you already know and just applying it to the harder problems. Because it's really cool that you could do something that looks like that with the knowledge that you did way back when. Um, kids, when they don't do that, they end up doing crap like this. <laughs> <laughs> example of this, like where they just memorize formulas and they don't get how math works. Like this is seriously, I have honors kids um, really good at doing logarithms and trig, and then I ask them to multiply a three-digit number by a three-digit number without a calculator. And like it'll take a little bit of time, but hopefully you know how to do it on paper. Just start doing. I mean, whatever, just do it on paper. They make this thing called a lattice, and if they did it right, this is what it looks like at the end. And somehow that's going to generate the I'm sure it does generate the answer, like, but still, they all don't know how to do this. I'm sure they learned it in whatever grade they were supposed to. And then it's like, okay, someone do like 20 times 37 without a calculator, and they start to make that. It's like, just, no, there are ways to do it that are simpler. But no, because they know the method and they don't think mathematically. It's it's like that cartoon, like <laughs> just approach the new situation with what you know. You'll figure it out. Um, seriously, I, I don't know. <laughs> but while we're on the topic, like part of the way you get kids to think mathematically is you get them to forget all the stuff that they think they know, and you kind of start from scratch. Like, take all that stuff you used to learn, we're gonna start over, and hopefully we can rebuild your knowledge from there. So this is what I want you to do with that paper for a second. We're gonna uh, see how fast you can, well, not really how fast, but if you could do this. What shape is that? Sure it is. It's a square. Uh, there's one square. Here's the question. If you had two square, and by the way, I'm gonna ask while we go through this, don't yell anything out. Let people figure it out on their own. The question is this, if you had two squares, and I wanted you to connect them like a jigsaw puzzle, the only rule is um, a side of the square has to touch the other side of the square, how many ways could you draw that with two squares? Raise your hand if you want to take a guess at this. Again, two squares, you got to connect them, but they have to share a side, basically. Not like half here and half here, like they got to share a side. Yeah. Are all the sides considered equal? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Four. Why four? What are the four? The four sides of the square. So you could go like here and here, here and here, here and here, here and there? Yes. Okay. Now here's what I'm going to say to that. That actually, that makes sense. I'm going to say that that's the shape you're thinking of, but really, all the shapes you just described are the exact same thing. They're just like rotated, and for our purposes, those are all the same. Okay, so there really is only one way to connect two squares if they share a side. Okay, how many ways are there to draw three squares if they have to share a side? Yeah? Two. What are the two? Uh, all in a line or sure. maybe an L. Did everyone catch that? Sure, that's exactly it. You could draw three in a row sharing a side or you could draw the L shape. And again, you could rotate that L shape all you want. They're all the same. Okay, uh, this is where the paper might come in handy. Four squares, how many ways are there to do it? Don't yell anything out, but see how many ways you can draw that. And one of the things, one of the reasons we're doing this is the best way to try to get as many shapes as possible is to try to find the pattern that's going on and maybe make sure you got everything along the way, you didn't skip anything that's obvious. That's one of the things we want to do here. Just, I'm not asking for an answer, but raise your hand if you think you know how many different shapes there are. Just raise your hand, that's it. Okay, keep taking another few seconds, see if you can get any more. If you're still working, keep looking down and keep working. Um, just raise how many shapes you think there are. I see anything from like four to seven. That's the range I am seeing. 
some people are wrong. <laughs> now make sure if there is a duplicate shape, if it's flipped over, if it's rotated, that's all the same shape. So we want to get rid of any duplicates. Raise your hand again with however many you think you see. Now we got a lot more. Be now we're getting between four and five. And one of those is the answer. Now, I will have, this is one of the things. This is actually called, this has a name in math besides square. This is called an amino. So this is, there's only one square, so it's a mono amino. There's two squares here, so it's a duo amino, better known as a domino. Tri amino. And actually, if there are uh, four squares, you actually get five shapes. Those are the five. And it's actually called a tetra amino, which is the basis for the game. Tetris. Tetris. This is where all the shapes come from. Oh, yeah. So there are five. And if you actually, does look, can you see the mouse? No. If you, uh, shape number, what, three and four can be flipped, and then you get really all seven of the shapes you would see in Tetris. But really, three and four are the, uh, those are the shapes. So this is where Tetris comes from. So this is where we, now the kids understand the game. Here's the real game. This is all warm-up. Five squares, how many are there? Go. <laughs> this is like Tetris 2. <laughs> if such a thing existed, and it should. We have an answer already. Yeah, figure out the pattern. In terms of like how many answers there are? Yes. Keep drawing and see if your prediction matches up. Again, the only piece of advice, try to find some sort of pattern to draw these shapes in so you're not skipping over stuff. When you want to make it really fun in class, you say, I will give extra credit to the first person with the right answer, but you only get one guess, and it'll never be right. <laughs> Someone has like two shapes, and they're like, I think I got it, but I don't want to go up and be wrong. Then you play Ice Ice Baby in the background while they do it. <laughs> This time around, keep drawing. If you think you have it, look around, see if your partner or whoever's sitting next to you, see if they're done, and compare answers. See if you missed one, see if you have an extra one. Feel free to talk to each other, though. Hopefully people are finding new shapes they did not have before. Okay. Raise your hand if you got more than seven shapes. Keep them raised. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. How many did you get? 15? Somehow there's 15 shapes. <laughs> Most of you are wrong. Almost all of you are wrong. And it's because you didn't get enough. Somehow I think you got duplicates. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead. Uh, this is how many there should be for 5. The answer is 12. 
So the question is, which ones did you miss? This one missed by a lot. The upper right. <laughs> but again, one of the ways to make sure you got all of them, and if you look at it, it's actually drawn this, this way. You start with the straight five in a row, and look at the pattern going left to right. Like, okay, I'll put one on one side, then another, oh, then I'm duplicating if I do that. Let me move one from the end and put it at the top and move it away. Like, there is a pattern to how these shapes are coming about. So it's cool. Like, it looks like there's a pattern. It looks like you could figure it out. So what was that pattern? How many monoominoes were there? One. Do dominoes? One. One. Triominoes? Two. Two. Then five. five. Now twelve. If if I said six squares, how many would there be? Twenty-seven. How many? Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven? It actually comes out to I think thirty-five. And that's for six. You want to do seven? It's like a hundred eight. <laughs> Someone did this. <laughs> and if you go on Wikipedia, because you just want to cheat, um, they actually have a list. Here's the thing, all my kids think like, okay, what if there were eight? And they're like, oh, I gotta find the pattern, I gotta find the equation, because everything in math is a pattern or an equation. And they try, um, and they come up with nothing. And it turns out, first of all, we have answers to these. Thank you, Wikipedia. Um, but the second thing is, there's no pattern. There's none. They haven't found one yet. and there's. Uh, it's very likely they won't. But it turns out if I said you had 13 squares, unless you had a computer brute force doing it, there's no equation that'll give you the answer. And that boggles their minds, because how could something like this not have a pattern? It's weird. Um, but it is cool that you could figure out all the shapes by just systematically going through stuff. Um, so that's one of the things. They don't think mathematically. They don't apply their own knowledge to the new stuff. They're so used to memorizing things. And that hurts them because they can't think higher level math until they get rid of this idea that it's just memorizing the formula. So that's one of the challenges I come across. Um, here's another obvious one. What's the obvious question every student wants to know about any math you ever take? When am I going to use this? And that's the thing. Like In a lot of cases, it's very hard to honestly tell students you're going to use this. Because in a lot of cases, they're not. But some of the math is going to be relevant, and maybe they don't know which part it is. But the goal is, how can you teach them stuff that you have to teach them in a way that makes it interesting for them? So um, if they don't know, they just get frustrated. <laughs> yes, go somewhere else. This is a real question that I got from an ACT test. During lunch, Lawn likes to create triangles with straws. <laughs> Three inch straw, four straw, what straw can he not? Juan has never done that in his life. <laughs> no one has ever done that in their life. And here's the thing. The whole thing is asking, if you know two sides of a triangle, can you tell me the range for the third side? That is a thing you learn in geometry. But what is this question telling students? It's telling them, we have no idea when you're ever going to use this in life, so we're going to contrive the worst possible scenario to try and get you to answer this question. Um, how about this one? This is from uh, a textbook. <laughs> They're playing a game with complex numbers. She has a score 5 minus 4i. Yes, 3 plus 2i. What's the total score? Who cares? You just need new friends. <laughs> this is so irrelevant. <laughs> and if you can't tell them when it's relevant, and here's the thing, even when the textbooks try to make stuff relevant, they do it in the worst possible way, because they'll set you up, like here's a real life scenario in which this equation is used. Set up, set up, set up, see, real life, doctors, whatever. And then, what do they do? Here's the equation, here's everything you need except the one piece of information you're looking for. So it looks something like this. Uh, bacteria, something about their growth and how fast they grow. See, real life, research. There's the equation you need to know. So what do my students do? They skip the whole top part, they get to the equation, they're like, crap. Followed by, okay, I gotta find as much of this stuff as I can. They plug it in, hey, 268 bacteria after this many hours. Look, I did math. No, you just plug stuff in, you have no idea what you're doing. But this is supposed to be a lesson about exponential growth. So the question is, how do you teach them to be interested in this stuff and know how to do this stuff 
in a way that's not as boring as this question. So let me play you this clip, and my guess is you're going to come up with your own questions that you want to know. So let me play this, and let's see what you can come up with. Hey, check it out. They got a pool. Mark, you want to play a quick game? Finally settle that debate about who's the better pool player. <laughs> I've never had that debate with anyone. Come on, we'll put a little money on it. Make it a little more interesting. Andy, please. No, I just figured because uh, pool's all about angles and he's a failed architect that he might want to play pool. Let's do it. Really? <laughs> that worked? How to Hustle Somebody in Pool by Andy Dwyer. Step one, find the person you want to hustle. Invite them to play pool. Should they accept? You're in. <laughs> and that's game. I think you now owe me $25. Shoot. Someone at a pool table growing up, huh? Hey, no, no, what do you say uh, we play again? We'll make it a little more interesting. Go double or nothing? Why not? Step two, lose to your opponent intentionally so they gain confidence. Step two has been completed easily. Very easily. Mark is, Mark is pretty good at pool. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That would be $6,400. Except <laughs> checks and most major credit cards. <laughs> yeah. Mark's way better than me. I'm going to... I'm going to say that there is at least a chance that I didn't think this through completely. <laughs> Without me having to do anything right now, what are the questions you want to know? How many games? How many games did they play? What else? That is, that really is the obvious one. How many, so figure it out. How many games did they play? What was the information? The first game was for $25, double or nothing, and 6400 was this last game. You have to pay for figure it out. How many games is that? Here's another question. Is that even plausible? Like, did the writers think this one through, or did they just make up numbers? <laughs> yeah, it, turn, I mean, it turns out not only is there an ant, what's the answer, everyone? Nine. Nine games. It turns out it actually works. Like, the writers must have sat and worked that one out. And here's another game. How long does a game, what were they playing? Maybe eight ball or whatever, or nine ball, whatever. How long does that take to play? I mean, if it takes an hour to play a game, does it make sense to play nine games? If it takes 15 minutes, like, would their friends be in the bar for that long? Does that even make sense? Um, so how, can you figure out an equation that tells you if they played 20 games, how much money is on the line? I mean, we could go from there. Um, is that realistic? How long would you have to play in order to win a new house? <laughs> now you need a lot more information. But here's the nice part about this. Same concept? I don't have to do anything. The kids want to know stuff. They're asking the same questions you're all asking. How many games do they play? Is it logical? And they figure it out themselves. And it's the same basic concepts. So that's one of the hard things. You've got to find a way to make this stuff relevant to them. Um, so here's another thing. Standardized tests, the thing we're judging these kids by, don't do anything to gauge their actual math sense. We want to know if they're good at math. ACTs and SATs aren't really the way to do it. Um, I, before I was teaching, I used to work for like six years teaching test prep classes, everything for like a, a test prep company. Everything from ACT and SAT to MCATs and LSATs and other stuff. This is honestly what one of the things we taught our students there. Five SAT tips. Plug in numbers when you can. Plug in answer choices, like work backwards. Uh, if two numbers are pretty close to each other, it's probably one of them. So at least you can narrow it down. Uh, keep track of what you're solving for. Uh, figure out if the drawing is to scale or not. None of this stuff says know your math. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter. If you know how to play the game, you don't actually need to know math. Um, and this is a typical question. 
This is a question they'll ask on the ACT or SAT. Like, what's equivalent to root 45? And the question's really saying, do you know how to simplify a radical? Can you break it down? What do we teach kids how to do? Literally, in a test prep class, how do you teach kids to do this problem? You really don't walk through how you break down 45 and do like a factor tree. You say, plug that in your calculator and get an answer. Okay, it's six point stuff. Well, it's not A, it's not E. Let's plug in B, C, and E. Nope, nope, you win. You have an answer. <laughs> you know math. <laughs> it's the worst possible way to do it. Let me give you a different question that actually requires thought that you would never see on an ACT test because it requires too much thinking. I'm going to show you this picture. I want you to yell out your answer. It's going to go from one through five. Yell out your answer as soon as you come up with it. Don't be shy. What's the weird one? What's the odd one out? Four, two, two, two. There is an answer. There is the right answer. You, Evan. You figure it out. One, three, two, three, two. Fight. I heard. I heard exactly the explanation right here. You want to say that out loud? Uh, what did you say first? Me? Yeah. And then? I said it could be two, three, four. <laughs> and then followed by? One. It's the only one that isn't different. It's the only one that isn't different. So one's the answer. Isn't that deep? <laughs> yeah. Two has no border. Three's a circle. Four is green. Five small. One's the weird one because there's nothing special and defining about it. <laughs> so that's the weird one. It's like Twilight Zone or something. But again, this question. You could reason your way to the right answer. It might take a little bit. You could eventually figure it out. They're never going to ask this on an SAT because there's too much trick to talk this one out. It's not easy. But again, the whole point is, even if this might be too difficult, the idea that you've got to think through a problem, that's not what they're testing you on. And if they're not testing you on that, what are they testing? What are they gauging from your SAT score? And the answer is not much. Um, and here's the problem with that. A lot of schools, for anyone who's uh, going to become an educator, for anyone who might go into policy, for anyone who just cares about this stuff because maybe you want to be skeptical about test scores and how we judge teachers in schools, we get judged on these scores in a lot of places. Um, and the truth is, a lot of states, they game the system. They say, well, we need uh, 100, no child left behind, we need 100% of our kids to pass a test. Let's just lower the pass rate because then more of them will pass. And they've done that. Um, the teachers teach to the test. They teach you how to play the game instead of learning how to do math. And that's a problem. Because it's really hard to find schools that are good enough where you don't have to worry about this on a regular basis. Like, I'm really fortunate that my boss doesn't come up to me and say, did you do, like, ACT prep? No, I can just teach the lessons I need to teach, and they lay off. Like, because they know the kids are going to be OK. Um, creativity is huge here. If you can't bubble it in, they're not going to ask you. Because who who's going to grade it if you've got to write stuff down? They can't afford graders. They can't get anyone to do that. Um, so they only ask you things you can bubble in. And that takes away a huge part of math and science, which is the whole thought process. Um, obviously, art, history, uh, science to an extent, all those other subjects that are so important thrown out because you've got to focus on math and English, because you can bubble that stuff in. Um, and the problem is a lot of jobs and test scores depend on how you do on this stuff. And so I want you to, when you leave here, I want you to be skeptical of those scores and realize those scores don't tell you everything you need to know. I don't know if you saw this, there was like a New York Times article last week about the, the New York, I don't know if it was New York City or New York State, but they published publicly the results of ranking every teacher in the school system and everyone could see it. And the lowest ranking math teacher in the city, they did an article about that teacher. And it turned out one of the reasons she was the lowest ranking is because she did such a good job with the kids she taught, they moved her to like special ed classes where the kids aren't as strong in math. So the scores didn't come up as much as they should have, and she's punished for that somehow for being as good as she was. Um, US News actually puts out a high school ranking. We know they do college ranking. They do high school ranking as well. 
and they use these scores. They also use AP tests. How many like advanced placement exams are taken in your school divided by how many students are in your school? And here's the thing. I'm, I'm, I said that uh, directly. They rank you par in part based on how many AP exams were taken. Not how many kids passed them. Just on how many tests were taken. So you could, I mean, and when I was in high school, our teacher, made, our principal made a push to get more students to take AP exams, and pushing in a lot of kids who had no business being in those classes. Um, I got sent to the principal's office once when I was in high school, and it's because I wrote for the school newspaper, and when the results came out after that year, I wrote an article that said that push for AP exams had mixed results. Because a lot of kids, more kids did pass exams, and the failure rate skyrocketed. And he was really pissed off that I said that. So that was a fun meeting. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. We, what ends up happening is you have students graduating from these schools. They're supposedly great schools, passing schools, um, the ones that the state's not worried about. But they still have no idea what they're doing when they get to college. And they can't do higher level thinking. That's a problem. Um, this last one, and this is what really bugged me. I made a career change. I was doing other stuff. Then I decided to want, I wanted to become a teacher. Education, like the certification program I was in, sucked. And it, like, we had very few discussions about what makes you a better teacher. It was all about, you know, like, by the book, how do you handle this situation in class? How do you deal with special ed kids? And those are very important subjects. But they didn't talk about how do you teach math effectively. That was like a one-time class with very few discussions in it. So where do teachers learn how to teach? And believe me, you don't get time in school to watch like good teachers do stuff. Um, here's a question that I was fascinated by when I learned about it in college, because I think this follows the line of getting people to think mathematically. We have a checkerboard. Here's the question. If you have a domino that takes up two squares in a row, how many dominoes would it take to fill that board? That's a domino. There are 64 squares, small squares. <laughs> in the checkerboard. How many dominoes would it take? 32. It's not your question. 32, assuming there's no overlap and there's nothing sticking out on the edge. Yeah, 32 dominoes. So here's the question. I remove those two from the corner. How many dominoes is it going to take? And more importantly, can you get it to work? And it sounds like it'll take 31 dominoes. But can you lay them out so that it works? In geometry, we talk a lot about proofs, like all my kids, first day of school, like what are you afraid of in geometry class? Proofs, everybody. I'm like, do you even know what a proof is? No. They just know they suck. And one of the things we talk about is in geometry, one of the things you want to do is you have two options when you have a theory that you want to prove. You can either prove it, which is proofs, or you could find me one example where it doesn't work, a counterexample, and show me that you can't do it. I'll take either one. So, if you want to show me that it takes 31 dominoes, prove it, draw me the setup, or find a way to show me that it can't possibly work. Anyone know what the answer is? Like, yeah? They're the same color that the ones you took out. They are the same color, the ones I took out. So what? So it won't work. Because, can you explain that? I mean, you're right. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah. It takes a red and a black, no matter how you play it. Yeah, every domino's taken up a red square and a black square, and ultimately, we're going to have 32 black squares, 30 red squares. Something's not going to work. And so we got a problem. So you can't do it. You would, they never talk about these type of questions and the way that you get discussion started in a math class. Like, that's one of the things I've been trying to change over the course of a couple of years now. Like, I know how to teach the curriculum. I know how to teach what the textbook says. What I am not as good at right now is really getting a discussion going in class. It's always like a one-way flow of information from me to the kids. Now one of the goals is how do you get the kids to kind of teach themselves and figure things out for themselves with just some guidance from me. Um, this is one thing we talked about. We talked about ellipses and equations for them. And we said, this is in an old math book. They actually said, when you talk about an ellipse, one of the things you talk about is there's a thing called a focal point. And an ellipse has two of them inside, inside the oval. Like, there's two of these uh, focal points. And according to this problem, it says, if you took a rock and you threw it right inside of one of the focal points, the way the ripples go out of the lake, it should coalesce at the other focal point and splash over there. 
which sounds really cool and weird. Like, you're telling me I could throw a rock here, but the splash will happen over there because of the way this thing is shaped. So we talked about this for a while, like, could this actually work? What would you need to know to figure this out? And we had this long discussion about what it would take, whether it would work, could it work, and what ended up happening is my kids made, went, they went home, they found the closest, like, basins that were elliptical that they could find. They made videos of this, they had to turn in their measurements. This is an example of one of the kids, I realize it's not in the list, but it's the idea of this thing. They measured this out. They found the focal point. They wanted to see if the splash would happen. Different type of base. Let's see if that works any better. You can kind of see the ripples coming together on the other side, even though you don't really see a splash. But it's cool. Like it gets them thinking about this stuff, and it was way more interesting to see this. Um, by the way, more to the point of why I'm bringing all this up, the point here is teachers never learn how to teach this stuff. Oh yeah, she gave me a thumbs up, but nothing happened, so I don't even know. Um, teach, we don't learn how to do it. So where do you find out how to do things in class that the kids might actually be interested in? Um, I learned a lot of the stuff I teach now from other math bloggers. Because there are bloggers out there who, spend, who post every day about, um, here's a lesson I want to try in class, this is what I'm doing, this is how I'm doing it. Do you guys have any ideas on how I can make this better? And then other teachers will try it out in their classes, and you go back and forth, and it's an amazing exchange of ideas. Um, so all the stuff like I'm showing you is all stolen from other people, because they, they are really good at coming up with this stuff. Um, why, should they, why should all of us care about this? Because we're skeptics, we're critical thinkers, we want this stuff to work. Students need to know how to reason their way through a problem, they want to test their hypotheses, think in different ways, they want to question what they hear. We talk about this in science at least more often. We never really talk about it in math, so that's one of the things we got to change. Um, and also, I mean, as skeptics, we want to teach kids, we don't want to teach them what to think, we want to teach them how to think. And that's a challenge in a lot of math classrooms. Um, this is one more example, just, this is a formula that they got to learn at some point. The outside of the sphere has how much area. And it's very easy to just give them that formula and say, all right, the radius is five inches. What's the surface area? And they'll give me an answer and they'll pretend like they know math. They learn nothing because they don't know what they just solved for. And the textbook just eggs them on. If the textbook gives you a tricky question for this, they'll just say, the diameter is 100. Figure it out. It's like, oh, I see what you did there. Like, that's, that's not math. They're not learning anything. So here's what we did. We took oranges. We took string. We had them figure out the circumference of this circle, because they should know what that is. And using that, figure out what the radius of this orange is without, without actually breaking it. Then peel the orange, because the peel is the surface. And if you draw a bunch of circles on your paper with that same radius, how much of your peel can actually fit in those circles? Um, and it turns out in this case, they fit their peel in like four circles, plus a little bit at the end. It turned out if they actually fit the peel in the circles, there should be four circles, which is why it's four pi r squared. And then we got a big discussion about why they got a little bit extra here. Maybe there's some white space in those four circles. Maybe they didn't have a perfectly uh, spherical orange. Uh, maybe the peel's like sticking up in the air, they need to smash it down. But again, it's cool. We can have these discussions in class, and the kids kind of figure their way out about how this stuff actually connects to the equations that you could just keep them. Um, sometimes they do artwork that's really fun. <laughs> <Some. laughs> this is what they doodle now. It's fun. Um, sometimes it's like, you know what? These kids are way more creative than we give them credit for. Let's just let them run wild. Go, ahead. we'll do trigonometry. Go make your own problem. And then kids come back with stuff like this. <laughs> the plane from Lost crashes into a house, but you're watching it on TV. There's even, this kid photoshopped debris on the ground. <laughs> okay. um, what about there? Just Angry Bird, you're throwing somehow. And just to make it annoying, you have to, I have to find the answer somehow with the pattern that she created. Um, here's a fun question, and this is up for debate. This is a grocery line. And that, the numbers are how much crap people have in their carts. So left line has people with three items and five items, two and one. Person on the right has 19 things in their cart. Which line do you stand in? 
The left line with four people or the right line with one person? Discuss amongst yourselves. Yeah, just... <laughs> like, 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 messy that? I'm just like, okay, other line. I'm, I'm gonna figure out what factors matter here. Exactly. 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 Go tell, ask all of them. Why are we like, talking without, without this answer there? Let's figure out like, like, what makes a difference in what your answer is. What are you considering when you're making a decision here? Their methods of payment. <laughs> Are they going to write a Okay, message, a method of payment. So credit card versus cash versus some crazy person still writing checks these days. Yes. What else? Whether you have to bag your own groceries? Yeah, are you bagging your own groceries or is someone bagging them for you? Yeah. Yeah. Are they like the hoarders on TV with like the giant photo albums of coupons and they're buying a thousand dollars of stuff that they have no use for? Yeah. Who's doing the, who's the cashier? Yeah. Is the cashier like... A teenager who knows nothing? Is it like a teenager who knows stuff and can go fast? Is it an older person who can go fast? Or is it someone who's like, I will spend an hour dragging this along? And are they alcohol? Yeah, alcohol. Do you need to get approval from a manager to buy stuff? Yeah. Does the guy on the right have like 18 of one item, one of the same item? Right, that you can just kind of punch in really quickly versus like 18 different packs of different things. All that stuff matters. Yeah, produce, which you got to type in manually. All that stuff matters, so just right out of your out of curiosity, raise your hand if you would stand in the left line. The right line. Okay, so the right line wins right now. How many items would it take for the right person on the right line to have before you say, screw it, I'm going to the left line? <laughs> raise your hand if you would switch lines if that right person had 30 items. 35? 40, is there a point that we could figure out? So that's the task for the kids. You figure out how many items that person needs before you switch. How do you figure that out? Well, you go to a grocery store, <laughs> you stand in line with a stopwatch, and you count how many items is that person buying, how long does it take on average, and you get a lot of that data, this and you so make a scatter plot, or you plot all this out, and you make a line, and you figure out an equation for this, then you figure out, okay, on average, a person with 19 things should take this long, um, but with interactions, you know, be a change in between, can you figure it out? I actually got kids turning in videos of them watching people. One kid said he got, like, scolded by the manager because the manager said, stop being creepy. <laughs> so, so he ended up sending me a video of his friend videotaping him on the side watching everyone. It's like a 10 minute video of a kid just... <laughs> <laughs> but they can figure this stuff out, which is really neat. And again, that's way more interesting of a discussion that talks about variables and what stuff you need to figure out. And it doesn't feed you any of the data. You gotta figure it out for yourself. People are gonna have different answers, and that's okay, because that's how math works. People are gonna have different ways of getting to the right answer. But hopefully they'll kind of coalesce around the right area. Um, Seth Godin, this great blogger, um, wrote this book called Lynchpin. He said being good at school is fine if you just want to do school. For the rest of us, being at school, being good at school is like being good at Frisbee. It's nice, but it's not relevant unless all you got to do is look up answers that are already known to other people. Most of the jobs that we need kids to go into in the future are jobs where the answer is not handed to them on a plate. They got to figure it out for themselves. And so our job as teachers is to get kids ready to think about things on their own, be okay with failing and getting stuff wrong, but going through that process. And a lot of the math classes don't teach kids how to do that. Um, so how do we help as teachers, as educators, as parents, as people who are interested in this stuff? Um, Open-ended questions. I started doing this a lot more on my exams, where the questions on the test, I, for example, here's a question I had on the test. Here's the question that was there. You have cable wire for an elevator. Um, the cable wire, uh, if you have like 100 feet of cable wire, it's good for a three-story building. If you have 150 feet, it's good for a four-story building. Like figure out an equation where if I give you how many stories I have, um, you figure out how much cable wire there is. That was the gist of the equation. Here's the question. Give me an acceptable domain for this problem. As in, how many stories would you expect to see a lot of the kids wrote down, like, uh, I don't know, zero to infinity. It doesn't make any sense. Like, 
You can't have infinity store. Like, you're wrong. Other kids, other kids, uh, one to a hundred. One? Why would you have an elevator for a one-story building? <laughs> or how about like, okay, two through forties. You want to include 2.5? How does that make any sense? Like, basically justify your answer. I don't really care what you put down as long as it makes some sense, but I'm going to poke holes in just about everything you say. So more open-ended questions, let them justify what they want to do, and we'll figure out if it makes any sense, and we can have that discussion. Um, let their creativity run wild. I give so much so many projects that usually come for extra credit because I'm not doing what all the other teachers are doing. And sometimes that's good, sometimes that's not. But basically, these kids are so much smarter than we give them credit for. So let them figure out something mathematical to do. And if music is your thing, you find a way to integrate what we're doing with music and show it to me. I'll find a way to reward you for it. But it's amazing the stuff they've come up with and shown me. And like, it's cool to see that side of kids because like, as opposed to English class, where you might be able to have discussions where you learn about what these kids think, I don't get to have that. But when they turn in projects that are all over the place, it's really neat to see that side of kids. And then be less helpful. It's so tempting when a kid doesn't know an answer to be like, the answer is 12. Oh, I need to shut up. Like, <laughs> let them figure it out. And if they're wrong, let them figure out that they're wrong. Like, when a kid's doing a problem on the board and you realize they just made a mistake early on in the problem, it's so tempting as a teacher to be like, you screw that up, that should be a positive sign, but it's negative for you because I don't want you to screw it up that way. Now I just shut up. They will figure it out and they'll learn their lesson. And that's really hard to do. But all this stuff gets them figuring out when they're doing things right and doing things wrong. And sometimes when you do that, they come up with really serious <laughs> <laughs> My students have a meeting. <laughs> Um, there's one last clip I have here. Uh, this is one of the things, this is an example of something I saw on somebody's website. And their only question is, there's a map problem here, there's a project here. I don't know what it is, but if you guys could give me input, I would really appreciate it. And what I saw, people sent, so people replied to this person with worksheets and different problems they could have done. And it's really cool. So I, I'll play the clip for you and you can kind of see where the map comes in here. And the same thing goes for quarterly reports. They are unreadable. They're just numbers, boring, and black. So what I'm thinking is that maybe we should have some sort of graphic, like if we have a bad quarter, put in a storm cloud. And when we have a good quarter, fireworks, or a race car. Doesn't have to be a race car. <laughs> Use your imagination. There's this cube on the screen, and it bounces around all day, and sometimes it looks like it's heading right into the corner of the screen, and at the last minute, it's a wall bouncing away. We are all just dying to see it go right into the corner. Pam claims that she saw it one day when she was alone in the conference room. Okay. I believe she thinks she saw it. I saw it. I saw it, and it was amazing. Who said I didn't see it? Did Jim say that I didn't see it? I saw it! We have a lot of colored paper here. Why do why we keep printing this on white? Ah, <laughs> I know. I know. I blame it. It's never gonna happen. Dude, you gotta you. believe. Maybe we could have some sort of riddle. Like something that you have to look for. Sort of a where's Waldo? <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Some days I am just on fire. <laughs> it was so cool to see the back and forth between the like math teachers who were chiming in on this. They're like, well, here's a pool table set up because you could do the same thing there. And, Here's the angles that they would have to find out. Here's the classes to be good for. It's a really cool thing to do. And then I talk to my colleagues about it. They're like, what's a vlog? And <laughs> uh, we don't talk about this nearly enough. Um, so I'll leave it at that. If you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. Um, can you make your PowerPoint available? Um, it's Part only because this is Keynote and not PowerPoint, so it's a big file. I can try to make it available somewhere. Most of, I, I will tell you this, a lot of the stuff that I'm using is on a few different uh, math websites, and I can 
get you the link to those. Um, I'll try to make this available somewhere. Send it to me anyways, because I need it for that. Yep. So I'll find a way to make it. Uh, yeah. What's your opinion on the value of homework? Um, so here's what I started to do this year about homework. Um, in certain classes, in my honors and AP classes, totally stopped caring about homework. I will assign stuff because the kids who need extra help, they need to know where to go to. Um, like what type of problems are we going to see on a test? They want to know that. So I give them that, those resources. I will go over the answers to those homework. We'll, we'll spend time just kind of going over the one or two problems that might have been the trickiest at the beginning of class, but I don't actually grade it. And if I do grade it every once in a while, it's just to see if they did it, like completion, and I don't care how accurate they were. With the lower level classes, if you let them have that much freedom, not only will they not do the homework, they won't even look at the material again. And that's a problem. So kind of in the lower level classes, I randomly check. For, I'll assign homework every day, and then one day every week or two, I'll just randomly pick a day to check it, and it's just checked. Did they do it? Do I see effort on their paper? If they just wrote down scribbles, like forget it. If they actually tried to do it and they got stuck, fine, good, full credit. So that's kind of lower level, I give them homework every day and I check it pretty often. The higher level classes, I assign it almost every day, but I don't really check. because. They know if they get, some kids don't need to do the homework to know the stuff, and I don't want to waste their time. Some kids just need a little direction about where to go, so I give them that. Yeah? Um, earlier in the presentation, you, you mentioned about, you know, but every year you have to erase what they previously know and, you know, start again. And like, I noticed this throughout my high school career that, like, my math, especially my math teachers, would constantly blame their predecessors for, you know, Oh, that what you've learned before was crap. Now you're going to learn this. Yeah, yeah. I remember having excellent math teachers throughout my you know high school, but it, it seems so frustrating. Like, oh, it's not my fault that my students suck <laughs> because it's like it's a president's fault. You know, and when I when I say you got to start them from scratch, it's not entire. I mean, I'm exaggerating only a little bit. Um, there are some teachers who suck, and a lot that are amazing, and no doubt about that. I guess uh, one of the hard things is is making sure, what happens a lot is that a lot of students, like here's one example of something that is really bad. They learn mnemonics for things a lot. Uh, like everyone remembers FOIA from algebra, but you give them a slightly harder problem to do, like maybe instead of like x plus y times a plus b, where you could FOIL that thing, it's like x plus y plus z times a plus b. The right thing to do is distribute the one thing to everything else. The wrong thing to do is stare at it because it's not two and two and you can't do the foil. But a lot of kids don't know that because what happens is in a lot of classes, it's just, it's not even a teacher's fault. It's, that's the way you learned it and you figured it out. So they teach it that way. And so one of the hard things to do is break them from the mnemonics and have them actually understand what's going on. That's not always the case that they know what's actually going on. So part of the thing is breaking them of, I know you know how to do this, but now let's relearn it for the right reasons. So sometimes they know what to do, but you want to get them knowing it for the right reasons, because that way when they do the more advanced stuff, it'll be easier for them to pick up on it. Um, and I mean, I certainly don't blame their teachers when they were younger, though it does seem like some, like that lattice multiplication method, all my kids seem to learn it that way from a lot of different teachers that they had growing up. So I mean, somewhere it's systemic in some parts where they're learning memorization instead of what's actually going on. So, Sometimes you can work your way down and fix things. Sometimes, especially depending on the way the district is structured. If you're a high school district where you're the only school that matters, like in that district, it's hard to tell, it's hard to figure out what's going on, lower level. I'm in a district that encompasses kindergarten through high school, so it's a little easier to coordinate between what's going on at each level of the way, so it's easier to fix. Um, yeah? Um. I know you want to get kids to think, but do you find kids have a handicap because they did not memorize their multiplication tables in grade school? Um, yeah, I mean, there is definitely, you have kids who come into these classes at very different levels, and so the challenge is you have kids who might be able to do mental math and some kids who can't multiply like one digit numbers without a calculator. So, okay, so the question is, okay, if, if I can find a way to get you to end, if all of you can enter the problem somehow, uh, like the pool table problem. 
the kids are all pretty even about, I want to know how many games they play. Some kids know how to figure that out. Some kids may not know how to figure out an equation, but they know how to brute force. Let me just write down $25 and $50 and 100 and they work their way through it. You want to find a way to give them questions that everyone can start off and up to a point where they're like, I think I know what I want to know. I want to know this, but I don't know how to solve that. Cool, let me help you where you're at. Meanwhile, this other student's already done with that part of the problem, but now they want to know something else. So that's kind of the challenge. How do you get them all interested in the same problem, and then you can help them wherever they are at? So yeah, it, I mean, it is frustrating, because even in my honors classes, some kids don't know how to do a lot of the basic stuff, whereas some kids are like, well, I know that. That's why I'm in this class, so teach me the hard stuff. It's like, how do you manage all of that? So it's frustrating, but it's not as bad for me. Uh, and that's not a thing on me, but it's not as bad for my classes, um, but I'm sure it could get pretty really bad, depending on what class it is. Yeah? Uh, I was wondering what you think, <clears throat> if you think that math is a unique advantage to teach critical thinking skills, uh, and to what extent educators of other topics can sort of use the sorts of things you were talking about in promoting critical thinking within their own. You know, one of the things, I think it's at a disadvantage in the sense that, like, in history, there's so many questions you could pose that kids would have to, like, what would have happened if, uh, I don't know, JFK hadn't been assassinated? What would have happened? There's no right answer to that, but, oh, man, your mind could run wild thinking of what could happen, and you'd have to back it up with a lot of different things. It lends itself to that. I think science does, too. I think English definitely does. So that part is not as easy. But if you can get the kids thinking, like, look, let me teach you this math that you know, and now let me show you an example where it doesn't work. What's the problem here? Like, for example, uh, what's the square root of 9? Kids will say 3. Okay, what's the square root of negative 9? And before they learn imaginary numbers or anything like that, they're like, you can't do that. But there is a way. Like, we can solve this problem or something. So how do they solve that problem when we don't know how to do that? Like, there is a way to get that discussion going. It's hard, but I think if you can, I mean, that's one of the challenges that we have. Um, there is a thing called Common Core, which a lot of states are adopting in the next couple of years. I think 48 states have signed on to do this curriculum, like a nationwide curriculum, by 2014. One of the things that they talk about is, let's ask fewer questions, but more in-depth questions. In general, that's one of the things. And that's a good idea. Like, yeah, let's, why don't, instead of me explaining a concept and then drilling you with a hundred problems that are exactly the same, let me ask you like two that are totally different and require different parts of your brain. Like, one example, um, if you have a cylinder and a cone on top of it, so you made like a silo of some sort, there's, I could ask questions like, what's the volume? Which, if you know the formulas, that's not a big deal. Just find the volume of that, find the volume of that, add it together. <laughs> Surface area, on the other hand, like what's the area of the parts you could see, that requires, well, I gotta get the area of the outside of the cone, but I can't see the bottom, so I can't include that. I can see the outside of the cylinder, but I can't see the top, but I could theoretically see the bottom. Like, they gotta think their way through that. Let's just give them one of those questions and see how they figured it out. Um, and if they get stuck, they get stuck. We'll talk about that. I mean, it's a different type of critical thinking. I, I don't know if it's at a disadvantage or an advantage. It's just a different type of problem they would have to do. But um, I don't think we were used to doing that. And I mean, that's the frustration I see from my other log colleagues, I guess. They're, that's the frustrating thing. How do you get students? Is, are, what are the problems that they could do that require them to think and that they're able to do with whatever knowledge they do have? I mean, that's tough. But there are ways to do it. It'll get better. Yeah. Um, so students always Google their teachers, so I'm sure that your students are familiar with the fact that you're yeah. a friendly atheist. <laughs> um, have you ever been criticized for being an atheist? Or? Never, never by the students. Um, never by the parents either. Well, one time, some lady from a religious right group tried to get parents to like get their kids out of my class because I'm an atheist. That failed. <laughs> um, yeah, they find out, and if they ask about like the website in class or whatever, it's like, we're, we're not talking about that. Like, that's it. And they usually, they understand that. They're not going to push it. Um, but, some, I mean, sometimes it's like, uh, hey, kid, why didn't you do your homework last night? Oh, uh, sorry, I was too busy selling my soul last night. Yeah, you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, we joke around about it, but we don't really talk about any of that stuff. So, it's never been an issue. You would think it would have been, but I don't know. Like, 
Uh, I, I think I go out of my way to make sure those two worlds don't really collide. So, so and I mean, my boss knows about the website. It's hard not to. Principal knows about the website. My principal even came up to me last week. He was like, we have a, uh, the IB, the baccalaureate graduation. Is that the right word for it? That's the one that's religious, that graduation. Whatever that is, there's like the, uh, the the graduation ceremony that's religious in nature, as opposed which one? Convocation. Maybe convocation, but whatever it was, it was like a faith-based graduation. It's voluntary for students. It's kind of like sponsored by churches in the area and stuff. But he even asked, like, he's like, hey, I want I'm giving a speech at this this uh, convocation thing. He's like, do you have any inspirational quotes that might work for like non-religious students too? I sent him a few and. I mean, they know about it, and they're very good about not pushing like, that boundary. So, like, I'm really lucky. I have very good bosses. Cool. If you have any other questions, let me know. And yeah, one more. I was wanting to know, what would you do if you had a, a kid in your class who, from the time that they started teaching math until they got to you, only used calculators? How would you teach them to learn how to actually think about math? Part of it is just getting them interested in the subject, that they want to do it on their own. I don't think I can force them to learn how to do it without a calculator when they've been using it as a crutch the whole time. Um, like this year, I actually, here's, here's an example of my internet world and the math world colliding. I got an email from a guy whose son um, actually gave a talk at a skeptic camp, just like this one. I forgot which date. Uh, but he was like a 12-year-old boy who, did, you guys ever see the Arthur Benjamin TED Talk? where he does like a lot of cool math in his head. It's amazing. But uh, this kid would do like three digit numbers square in his head, uh, or four digit numbers squared in his head. Really incredible mental math. Um, and so he did this for the Skeptic Camp audience. And his dad's like, hey, I thought you might be interested in seeing this video. The video was awesome. Like, oh my god, this kid's there. And months later, the dad's like, hey, we're actually going to be in Chicago for like this week doing some stuff here. Um, he just wanted to know if you could like get together, like do stuff I'm like, tell this kid to come to my class. So this kid came, and he performed like a 15 minute show at the end of one class, the beginning of the next one, um, for like some of my smartest kids. And they're watching this 12 year old do, like they can't multiply two digit numbers, my kids. Like, you know, right? <laughs> this kid's squaring three, four digit numbers, doing like making a magic square out of thin air, doing amazing things, and like, they're just like, oh my God, that is so cool, how do you do that? Once they get that fascination for it, they want to figure it out on their own. It, again, like I said, it's really hard for them to figure it out, uh, to make them want to learn how to do it when they don't need to. And to be honest with you, I know they have a calculator. Not everything has to be done mental math. I mean, there's some <laughs> chapters we do where it's like, you're going to have a test where you can't use a calculator, and I will give you numbers that you can deal with. And then I'm going to give you the same test with like different numbers that you need a calculator for, like different questions and stuff. Um, so, I mean, we're trying to balance it. They need to know how to do a few basic things, and usually they're okay with the basics. I know, like, even the stuff that I feel they should be able to do in their heads, you know what, if they can't do it, I'm not going to spend my time teaching them how to do all of that. If they want to learn that, they're going to have to figure that out on their own. Maybe I can give them a tip or something. Otherwise, it's, look, here's the mental math you need to be able to do. It should be easy if you can't figure this out. But you can use a calculator. Um, if I can tell a really quick story, one of the things we got to do this year that was really neat is they want to pilot a program because they know every kid in our school has something like this. And it's silly to tell kids don't use your cell phone in class when half of us have been sitting in the audience using our cell phones all during this thing. It doesn't mean we're not paying attention, but we're, we're interacting in different ways. So they're like, how can you use their smartphones or their tablets or their computers with a Wi-Fi connection in class in a productive way? So one of the things we got to do at the end of the year is like, I can tell them, here's a problem, go to Wolfram Alpha and figure this out. Or here's a problem and like, text me, using a different program, but like, text me your answers to this and I can say like, uh, like whatever, uh, Elise, uh, that's the right answer. Uh, Jesse, uh, I think you multiply by the wrong number, double check that. It's really easy to do like that without me having to walk around all of the places. Like it was cool, so we could play around with stuff and see what works and what Thank you.